I'm a pretty formal pastor. I like formal services, but there's no command in the Bible for us to be formal. There is a command in the Bible for us to serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Amen. And we do fear our God and we want to be reverent, but we can also enjoy with uh, his apostles his word. And so we want to, we're going to do that in the second service. It's going to be like a Wednesday night in some respects. I want to open with this verse of scripture like I would ordinarily open up a second service with scripture. The Sadducees have come to Jesus and presented him with a case of seven women married to one man successively, sequentially, consecutively. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Amen. And so Jesus, the man from Galilee, who was the son of God, yet from Galilee, said to Sadducees that were well educated in the scriptures, Ye do err. You are wrong. You're in error because you don't know the scriptures. And that was a rough thing to say to Jewish leadership. David wrote this in some verses that we're quite familiar with from Psalm 119. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. And they that are ever with, this right here, are the commandments, not the enemies. Thy commandments are ever with me. My trust is in them at all times, and you've made me wiser than mine enemies. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation, and I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy, thy precepts. We love these three verses because wiser, more understanding, and I understand more. Number two reversed is number three. Those blessings over enemies, over teachers, over the ancients. And of course, I like thinking of the ancients as the church fathers, because there's never been a more confusing group of men put together than the church fathers of the various periods of time that they call the church fathers. We love God's word. And the errors that we see around us and errors that we've had in the past ourselves are because we didn't know the scriptures, but we want to know them. And they're able to make us wise. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' glorious name, we thank Thee through the living word for the written word. We thank Thee for what we have in the Bible. We thank Thee for our King James Bibles. Amen. We thank Thee for every word. Heavenly Father, remember that we have a recently updated document on our website pointing out 22 one-word arguments that You have shown us because we believe that your Bible should be trusted at the word level. Amen. Bless us in this assembly. That we will not forget what we covered in the first assembly. That our trust in thee, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his finished work, in his resurrection, in our power and prayer by his name, and all that is promised there, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, would be the bedrock for our lives but heavenly father we would not know those things we could not know those things without a bible that we can trust mm -hmm. our faith starts with your word and it's in your word that you tell us about your son jesus christ bless us in his name by his spirit in this second assembly in jesus name amen I invite you to turn with me in your Burgundy hymn books to number 230, please. Come, let us join our cheerful songs. Come, let us join our cheerful songs.
songs is what he wants from us, right? Cheerful songs. We're the redeemed. The angels were not redeemed in the same sense that we were. That's right. That's good. 146, please, has been requested by, uh, I think I counted three in the congregation. 146, how firm a foundation. I invite you to stand with me. We'll sing this. How firm a foundation is Dividing the word of truth 
is our theme for this second service this Lord's Day, and we'll continue from where we were on Wednesday evening. We covered about 170 slides last Wednesday night, but we have 410 now, so we'll cover as many new slides as we can. First timers hearing this or seeing this should go back and review the 170 or so that we covered last Wednesday evening. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Any children 10 years of age and under that want to see me after the service that know that verse, I have something for you. Some of you already have, and I'm building my list. Let's say this verse together. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And amen. Jesus Christ is the preeminent goal of our lives and our church. Jesus is known only by the Bible, which must be rightly divided or we miss him. If we don't have a Bible, we can't learn about Jesus Christ. If we don't rightly divide the Bible, we get confused with the wrong Christ. And Paul did warn that there was another Jesus. Our faith rests on inspiration, preservation, and interpretation. Amen. And interpretation is rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's where our faith comes from. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we need a word of God to be inspired, preserved, and then properly interpreted. This is a make-believe picture, but it's the best we can do, of Philip the Evangelist with the Ethiopian eunuch rightly dividing Isaiah 53. Because the eunuch's question was, was the prophet speaking of himself or another man? He needed that passage to be rightly divided. When Philip drew near to that chariot and asked, Understandest thou what thou readest? The eunuch answered with these words, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the passage goes on to say, Philip preached to him Jesus. Right. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth the word of truth being the bible what is the most important part of this great verse that was given by paul to timothy the last third rightly dividing the word of truth god wrote the bible with contradictions to mock his enemies they only appear to be contradictions they're not real contradictions we can solve them easily by using the bible's own internal rules of hermeneutics or interpretation. What is true in one case may not be true in a different case. What was the commandment that we looked at on Wednesday evening that this was true about? Thou shalt not kill, the sixth commandment. It, it's true in some cases and it's not true in others. Some lives are to be taken as we learned Wednesday. God gave this teaching rule in the Old Testament but he used different wording for it. Instead of rightly dividing, the Old Testament is, gave the sense. It's Nehemiah 8.8. 8. Right. And here's Ezra and the Levites that were with him, the teachers of the people of Israel, when they came back out of Babylon to Jerusalem. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly. They read distinctly and gave the sense. They gave the one proper interpretation and meaning and caused them, that is the hearers, to understand the reading. So it starts with reading in a book and it ends up with understanding. Right. And we do that by giving the right sense, by rightly dividing the words. When Ezra gave the sense and caused them to understand, he explained different meanings and applications of words that are missed by just reading or by just dictionaries. Right. Everyone knows basic words. Dictionaries record that knowledge. As I explained, a dictionary is a history book of what word meanings are known to the average person. 
when we're talking about average words like in a King James Bible. But sometimes God uses words differently for us to rightly divide them. He will use a word in a different sense than we thought or think that it means, and we want to rightly divide that and apply it the way he's taught us in the Bible. Sometimes God uses words differently, and so we want to give the right sense to those words. The people of Israel needed Ezra to teach large and small differences in words for their better understanding of God's word. Now, what is this? It's a dog. But remember, I can't go over the 170 slides from Wednesday evening. I have to keep pressing forward. So all you do is get a short glimpse of a German shepherd, and it is a beautiful dog. Yes, I said that. <laughs> Rightly dividing dog. Do you remember that dog had nine meanings in the Bible? How many occurrences of dog were there? 40, with nine meanings. And we saw that in Deuteronomy 23, it was a sodomite, pastors in Isaiah 56, because a barking dog is a pastor doing his job, and so forth, and that list we've been through already. If we did not divide the word dog, and we happened upon the word dog in Deuteronomy 23, it means you cannot tie the sale of puppies. Bark, dogs that do not bark are greedy and never filled, according to Isaiah 56. So dumb dogs that can't bark never get full. And we can go on and on. No Lord's Supper to dogs. Have we ever tried to feed the Lord's Supper to dogs when we think of a four-footed creature? But if we didn't make a division, Jesus said, Give not that which is holy unto dogs. What is dividing the Bible? What example might help you? And here's an example that I may have mentioned last Wednesday. I didn't have slides for it, and I want to show it to you right now. It is like taking mixed up cards, like playing the game of 52 pickup, and sorting them by some criteria, like solitaire. Now you've got this big pile of cards, and this is all the occurrences of a word or a concept in the Bible. It's, on a big, it's in a big pile on a table in front of you. It's in the Bible, but for our example, it's on a table in front of you. Rightly dividing the word of truth is putting them into piles of like cards. Right. Like that. Does that help you under... Rightly dividing. Children, the word divide means to separate into parts. And so when we rightly divide the Bible, we take the Bible's use of words and put it in different piles. We show that they mean different things in different places, those words. In the dog example, we had 40 uses of the word dog with nine different meanings. In the dog example, if we were still thinking about cards, we would have 40 mixed up cards on our table and put them in nine piles. Right. That's what rightly dividing the word of truth is. The preacher must study all 40 verses about dogs and separate them by nine different meanings. That's what he does by being a worker, a workman, that's not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we do this with lion, which I did yesterday, we have 124 occurrences and 21 meanings. That's a little too large for me to put on slides for you, though I did write out the 21 and send them to someone in the church just to show them that's what would happen if we did the word lion can you think of someone really really good that is called a lion the lord jesus christ is a lion can you think of someone that's really really bad that's called a lion the devil's called a lion and there are lots of lions in between 21 in both cases dogs and lions we ignore similes. I am not talking about a simile where it says, I am as hungry as a lion. We did not use any verses like that. We used verses that said, the lion did this or that. And you, it, so there's no comparison being made. It's just a lion doing something. Or he is a lion. Not like a lion. Those are too easy. Those are similes. But the Bible has metaphors where there is no word like or word as. A simile 
is a comparison. I am hungry as a bear. I am hungry as a lion. It's got that little word as in there. If we say about Asahel in the Bible, he could run like a deer, is that a metaphor or a simile? It's a simile because it has the word like in it. We didn't cheat by using any of those. Uh Uh-uh. The 124 occurrences of lion, forgetting all the similes, had 21 different meanings. Reading Bible words carefully, we start with reading, carefully and explaining what each one means in its context can be tedious, remember? And men don't like that today. This is a good description of what most Christians are like today. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will not endure it. This is not a happy word. (laughs) Endure means that you have to put up with something that isn't very pleasant. And so they don't like listening to sound doctrine anymore because it's just a boring doctrinal sermon. But after their own lusts, because they just want to be, they just want to have something easy, something fun taught to them. So they heap to themselves teachers that don't teach doctrine, but will scratch their itching ears because they have itching lusts. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They turn away their ears from the truth they don't want the truth anymore they want fables they love tim tebow tim tebow getting getting up in their platform behind their pulpit and telling about playing college football they love things like that instead of sound doctrine now this is a pastor's outline that wants to show you the book of acts in one slide Now, there's a lot of dividing there. You see all the divisions that are being made. Now, this pastor has never divided anything in his life except the millions that he makes into several different multi-million dollar houses. This is rightly dividing the word of truth. But who wants to sit in a church where that might be put up on a slide and explained? They would rather sit in a church like this where they can hear that God wants them to be a winner and to make millions just like Joel. But not everyone can make millions just like Joel. But let's go on. Neglect. If we neglect rightly dividing or we reject rightly dividing, it's going to lead to heresy. We're going to end up in an error. What does rightly dividing actually mean? Now, those of you that like more precise definitions. Let's go do it right now and do it quickly. Dividing. Divide. To separate. We already knew that. You already know this definition, but I want you to think about it. To separate a thing into parts. Isn't that what we already know about divide? Or a number number or collective body into smaller groups to split up, to break or cut asunder. That's what divide means. So when we divide the Bible, we take a word that's used over here like sleep. And we know that it means sleep in some places, but in other places the word sleep means death. There's a pretty big difference between sleep and death. And so that's dividing them up into two different piles. This is continuing a true definition of divide that you already know, but I want to show some of its details. To separate into classes. We had nine classes, nine categories of what the word dog meant. To distinguish. To distinguish the kinds of. To class or classify. It was used this way in scholastic use. Our King James Bible, though written 407 years ago, was very current and is still very current. Scholastically, meaning when you are studying a book, you use the word divide to draw distinctions with regard. And so now we're thinking about the word distinguish since divide equals distinguish when it's used this way. So what does distinguish mean? To make a distinction. Does that sound familiar? It's what we had right back here. You say, where was it? Right here. Distinguish, to make a distinction in or with respect to, there it is again, 
Isn't that amazing? This word divide in our King James Bible is a scholastic word. It's a word that is very current and very appropriate for studying a book. To draw distinctions between various meanings of a word or statement. Is that exactly what we do? That is exactly what we do. Hence, to make subtle distinctions. Amen. To make or draw a distinction. This is what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. To make or draw a distinction. To perceive or note the difference between things. There's a difference between things. To exercise discernment, to discriminate between things that are different. Okay, did you get that? For those of you that like definitions and want to see it, it's precious. Remember what happened. Satan doesn't like rightly dividing the word of truth. So, Satan took the word divide out of the modern Bible translations. Right. Took the word divide out. Is the word divide some antiquated word that we can't understand? Is it some word that doesn't apply to proper preaching? It's the perfect word. Thank you, blessed God, for it. Amen. We rightly divide if we put a sense on a word that fits the context and the truth. So we have all kinds of ignorance and nonsense coming out of pulpits and book publishers by those that reject rightly dividing. They don't even want it in 2 Timothy 2.15. Slain in the Spirit. Where is it in the Bible? Nothing even close. Who invented it? Recent charismatics in the last 40 years. Rodney Howard Brown is this guy up there on the platform. A nutcase. People laying on the floor. Other women have to run around and throw blankets over them because the women get very immodest when they throw themselves on the floor. Where is this in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. But once you start down the road of using the Bible without rightly dividing it, where are you going to end up? The Bible is actually a limiter to us. It keeps us in the way of truth because we can't go outside it. This guy doesn't care about going outside it. Charismatics don't care about going outside the Bible. They'll go outside it. They'll have visions that Fidel Castro, this is Benny Hinn, visions and dreams that Fidel Castro is going to die, but Benny had those dreams 30 years ago. That Jesus is going to return, but Jesus didn't return. Benny's wrong, wrong, wrong. Back to our verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rodney Howard Brown ought to be ashamed, but he's too ignorant to be ashamed. We're ashamed of him. And Christianity ought to be outlawed, if that's Christianity. But that isn't Christianity. We want, we, you want your pastor to be a workman who studies to rightly divide the word of truth. Who is the seed of Abraham? Which one of these pictures? The middle one? Okay. Over here we have Orthodox Jews, and over here is the flag of Israel. And when we ask about the seed of Abraham, it's neither one of those, because the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ right. and those who are in him. Now, before I leave this slide, and I appreciate a faithful wife, what is wrong with this slide? Beautiful. Charlie, dry pastor baptistry. I like this slide because it is so creative to create a, a baptistry in the Middle East. Baptistry by cat. <laughs> baptistry by cat. But there's a problem because it's a dry pastor baptistry, and we don't like that because that's starting to stray from the Word of God because of that picture. Who was it? I forgot. The picture that I showed earlier in these slides, Philip and the eunuch, they both went down into the water and they both came up out of the water. So that's what we do. Some uses of Israel are for physical Jews, spiritual Jews, and sometimes for Gentiles when you see this word Israel. The rule in both Testaments 2 Timothy 2.15, New Testament. Old Testament, Nehemiah 8.8, is for preachers. They better use it. Here we go. 2 Kings 
two and twenty years old was Ahaziah. So we're talking about Ahaziah when he began to reign. How old was Ahaziah when he began, began to reign or when he became king? He was 22 years old. Now we're in 2 Chronicles, and it's the same Ahaziah. Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. Which should we go with? Yes, is the correct answer. We go with both. 22, 42, 22, 42. Oh no, what a terrible contradiction in the Bible. Was Ahaziah 22 or 42 when he became king? Does 22 equal 42? Well, the 22 means something different than the 42. He was 22 years old in his biological age. He had had 22 birthdays. But he was 42 years old as measured by God in the dynasty of wicked Omri. Right. And there are ways to figure that out. And right here is our extensive, thrilling, wonderful document showing it. Now, are we the only ones that know this about Ahaziah? No, we are not the only ones. We are some of the very few at the current time that know this about Ahaziah. But the older students of the Bible, they, weren't, they didn't have any difficulty with the 22 and 42. They had it figured out, and we have them listed in our document right there at that link. Here's the problem. Without rightly dividing, how do we rightly divide? Ahaziah was 22 years old physically, biologically. He had had 22 birthdays, but he was 42 years in the dynasty of Omri. By knowing that, we learn something. We learn something that God looked at Ahaziah, who was a great, great, great grandson of David, and did not count him as a great, great, great grandson of David, and did not believe that Ahaziah and his son, and his son, son, belong in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Right. So, in Matthew 1.8, there are three kings missing that we know why they're missing because we accepted that right there Amen. and explained it and found it. Without rightly dividing here, you cannot know why three kings are missing in Matthew 1.8. What do modern Bible versions do since they have rejected rightly dividing? They change their Bibles to 22 in 2 Chronicles to match, so they lose God's wisdom for Matthew 1.8 and other similar uses of age that are referring to your length in a dynasty rather than your biological age. And there's three that we know of in the Old Testament. They miss that and they miss Matthew 1.8 because they want to play games. And is there anyone that says they believe in the originals more than them. But they will change their originals to make kings equal chronicles with 22. We leave it 22 and 42 because God's trying to tell us two different things, which is called rightly dividing. And I promise you that the outline on Ahaziah is fun to read. Let's jump to another subject. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is... The first of three chapters called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said lots of things there that we have to rightly divide. Lots of things. He said in verse 34, But I say unto you, swear not at all, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Let's put this into practice. Yea. Nay. Yea, yea. Nay, nay. Well, I can't say anything else, folks. Because it said, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. Let's just start dividing really simply. <laughs> Do you just want to hear me stand up here and say, yea, yea, nay, nay. And if you say to me, if you say to me, the only communication that's under consideration is swearing, I'll say you're starting to rightly divide. Let's just keep going and figure it out. But that's what it says in Matthew chapter 5. What denomination is known most 
in the United States for taking this literally and will not ever swear. Jehovah's Witnesses will not swear in court. And there are others that follow them by misunderstanding this passage of Scripture. God likes to swear. When God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. So God swears. Here's God swearing again. I swear in my wrath. It was a commandment to swear. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. God wants us to swear because it's an act of worship. Moreover, I call, this is Paul swearing. Moreover, I call God for a record. Now, what's he saying that for? He wants to tell the Corinthians that he is telling them the truth and he wants them to know how serious he is about what he is saying by calling God to record. That's an oath. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet into Corinth. I have not been to Corinth yet, not because I'm neglecting you, but because I'm being merciful to you. And I call God to rest, that's swearing. And the angels swear. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. So Jesus said, swear not at all. God swears. Paul swore. Angels swear. If we do not rightly divide, we're going to end up with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus, here's, here's how we rightly divide. Jesus condemned the false and frivolous swearing of the Jews, right. which you can find in Matthew 23. And this is our long document showing it because swearing is an act of worship. It's a good thing. And you need to keep these three rules when you swear. It should only be for important things, not hitting your finger with a hammer. In God's name only, never anything else, especially animal excrement, and you keep what you promise by your oath. Or we're Jehovah's Witnesses. If you don't make this distinction, God is a sinner, Paul's a sinner, the angels are sinners, and they've all violated their own religion. But we know better than that. This is what swearing is. That's a, that's a holy Bible. And our president's left hand is on it, his right hand is held up, and he's swearing. He's being sworn into office that he's going to uphold our Constitution and be a faithful president. Let's keep going. As well, the singers, this is a new subject, we've got to keep moving. We have singers and we have players on instruments. Shall be there, all my springs are in thee. So this is a church service. And there's going to be singers and there's going to be players of instruments. Was it the Old Testament or the New Testament? It's old because it's David. Now we have heaven. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Is that a musical instrument? Did it get your attention that there is a musical instrument there? That there are harps, and they're harping on the harps. And there are harpers harping on the harps. But that isn't a New Testament church either. That's heaven. We do not have either instrument in services. You know, we've got the young babe playing her electric guitar on the left. And we've got the less babe on the right playing a piano. We don't have either instrument in our church because we rightly divide the word of God. We go back and we look at this and we say, well, that's heaven. We go back to this and say, well, that's the Old Testament. We reject David's instruments and animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. We're not going back to David's religion because he killed animals as well. We reject Gabriel and Michael's instruments until we're in heaven. We rightly divide music and stick with the apostles who told us to sing. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, we sing. We don't play. The Lord knows how to use the word play. Right. He had playing in the Old Testament because it's childish, and he has playing in heaven for whatever purpose he has for it there. 
you're not going to be married in heaven, but there's going to be some kind of music. But here in the New Testament church, we sing so that we don't have all the trouble that churches are getting themselves into by bringing musical instruments into the church. Let's go. New one. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Women shouldn't wear men's clothing. Men shouldn't wear women's clothing. And those that do that are an abomination to God. Is this an abomination to God? If you think so, when was the last time you saw a man wearing that? <laughs> We're rightly dividing the word of truth. Right. Are there denominations that take this verse and do not believe a woman can ever put on a pair of pants? Because they don't rightly divide it. That's about as feminine as you can get. I mean, it's just, it's pink and it's modest and it covers and it's pants, but I haven't worn anything like that in a while. <laughs> and I hope you haven't. Amen. Now this woman, she's been to the barber and she's wearing clothes that pertain to a man. She's trying to look like a man and this man is trying to look like I don't know. He needs to shave his legs. You say, are you trying to entertain us? No. No. Is there a Bible verse like this in the Bible, or did I make this up? Does that Bible verse right there cause some people to stumble? It does. Do we have a verse in the New Testament that says that we cannot endure an effeminate man in our congregation? It does. We rightly divide that that verse, Deuteronomy 22.5, is condemning effeminacy, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, cross-dressing, transvestism, transgendering, gender-bending, and role-playing. That's what's included. Those kind of sins related to trying to play the role of the other sex. Let's keep going. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. My sons thought I believed that many times. That I could beat as hard as I wanted to and they would not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Whoa, guys, it was worth it. <laughs> Look at what the verse says. Just think about it. If thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Does that mean you can beat him as hard as you want to and God's going to keep him alive? No. No. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Can you save your children by spanking them? No. If you do not divide these verses, verses, you can beat as hard as you want and beating will get them to heaven. We rightly divide those verses to teach that beating saves a person from premature death. Thou shalt beat him with, uh, if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. He shall not die a premature death because of crimes, because you've taught him that the life of crime doesn't pay. And that hell is a grave for a premature death. You'll deliver his soul from hell. That's what those verses mean. And how do we arrive at that? By rightly dividing them. Do we have other places in the Bible that show us hell is the grave and not the lake of fire? Definitely. Amen. Let's go. John 9. We, we're happening upon the man born blind. And his disciples asked him, this is the apostles, to Jesus, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. That's three people that are sinless but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. We rightly divide by pointing out that he was born blind. Which of his parents, or did he sin, to cause his blindness? None of them sinned to cause his blindness. All three were sinners. We rightly divide and give the sense that all three sinned 
but neither the parents nor the son's sins caused his blindness. Jesus made divisions in words that friends and enemies missed. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Well, they got all worked up that it took them 40 and 6, excuse me, took them 40 and 6 years to build that temple, and how was he going to rear it back up in three days? This is John 2. We were there a couple of years ago. Jesus said, destroy this temple. What was he referring to? His body. What did they think he was referring to? Herod's temple. The added on monstrosity from Zerubbabel. And it took 40 and 6 years. Jesus did this in John 11. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, this is Jesus to his apostles, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Everything should be fine. What did Jesus mean by the word sleep? He's dead. Now, since I only gave you verse 14, does he shortly say that? Apostles, he's dead. But let's go take care of him anyway. Because with the Lord, it doesn't really make any difference. But with us understanding the Bible, we better understand it. Have you ever heard of a heresy called soul sleep? You better understand the word sleep. What part of us sleeps when we die? Our body only. Does our spirit sleep at all? Not, our spirit will be more awake than it's ever been awake in its existence. Because it'll be in heaven with the Lord. Rightly dividing. Words with several senses must be classified by those senses. Words with several meanings should be classified by those meanings. Learn the habit. That's why we're going through these examples. Learn the habit of classifying words with different senses with me. Because when you read the Bible, you want to have that so that when you run and you want to have that in your mind, that you're willing to do it. So that when you see what looks like a contradiction, you won't be afraid. You'll just say, this is the Lord giving me an opportunity to rightly divide. Right. Nurture. Nurture an instinctive desire to look for alternate senses. Every occurrence of a word or concept must be studied, and then you can see it falling into different piles. The rule requires defining terms, which is one of the definitions of wisdom. Embrace it, that we define terms. We see the word sleep, but we want to define it carefully. Sometimes it may mean literal, actual sleeping. Sometimes it may mean death. Sometimes it may mean being a lethargic, carnally-minded Christian. Awake thou that sleepest. Is that literally sleeping? Is that literally death? Or is that a third category? It's a third category. Here we go. At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. This is a precious passage to us. They didn't know how to rightly divide the word of truth. All they could do is think this way, black and white, black and white, black and white. Can't do that on the Sabbath. Either there's things you can do on the Sabbath or there's things you can't do on the Sabbath. It's black or white. And so they immediately jump on the apostles and condemn them for doing something wrong and something that's against the law. Pharisees only see black and white. Jesus, what did he do? He went and told them about David, eating showbread that was not lawful for anyone but priests to eat. Number two, explaining that priests work the hardest on the Sabbath day. Of the whole week, they work the hardest on the Sabbath day. Third, he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. What do you think of that? Four, God loves mercy more than he does commandment keeping. And he was drawing this from Hosea 6.6 6 and Proverbs 21.3. And number five, he explained, the Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Right. Five ways, reasons, powerful arguments to rightly divide the word of truth. And he gave us a jewel 
when he taught us in Matthew 12, 7, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And in Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Right. You must learn to judge rightly. Rather than this black and white, this isn't judging at all. That isn't judging. You can teach a parrot that. You can teach a dog that. That isn't judging. There's no judgment involved. But we've got to learn to judge rightly. To judge rightly, there's that word. Like David and Jesus, rather than by black or white appearance, even without verses for the case, we have got to be able to think and judge by a righteous judgment rather than appearance, which is in John 7 and verse 24. Jesus, rightly dividing in this case, and the resulting verses are of great importance for godly thinking. And we use them in our Christian ethics. If ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, which is a tremendous principle of righteousness, and it's not black and white. You say, well, that's a rule. I will have mercy, but it's not black and white. It's got shades of gray. Let me remind you, in Numbers 15, a man picked up sticks on the Sabbath day. What happened to him? Stoned to death. Jesus' apostles picked up corn on the Sabbath day. What happened to them? Exonerated by Jesus Christ. Right. You better learn how to tell the difference. One was a presumptuous sin. The other one had a need. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire. What happened? God killed them. David ate the showbread. Jesus used it as a good example of intelligent thinking and righteous judgment. What was the difference? One was presumptuous and one had a need. How long had David been without food? It was the third day. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. These two verses that I've just shown you and I've said this before are worth thousands and thousands of dollars to a counselor to help someone in marriage difficulties. Right. Marriages can get so complicated you can't see the forest for the trees. They get so messed up. There's so many problems and issues to deal with when you try to make a decision tree. You start at the left of the front wall up here and you end up at the right wall and you can't keep track of what you just went through. And the Lord Jesus Christ gives you something as simple as, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Now, does that mean that we presumptuously go out and pick up sticks on the Sabbath day? Uh-uh. Does that mean we presumptuously go out and offer strange fire? No. Okay, let's keep moving. Oh. Nephilim. Nephilim. Detroit may believe it, but we don't. <coughs> Nephilim. Angels had sex with women, and their little babies became big monsters. That's the doctrine of the Nephilim. We don't believe in the Nephilim. Where did the doctrine of the Nephilim come from other than somebody that's read too much science fiction and is too much into political conspiracies? Those that believe in political conspiracies love believing that there are Nephilim sitting at the Rothschild's table, Nephilim in the Council of Foreign Relations, Nephilim in the United Nations, Nephilim in the Illuminati, and so forth. They are the Nephilim. These little babies from sex and women became big monsters that looked like this, maybe. And sometimes they put on suits and you can't tell who they are. I might be a Nephilim. <laughs> they are the Nephilim. This is another picture that they've made up. Here's a six-foot man over here, oh, I wish. <laughs> anyway, six. <laughs> all the way up to, you should see, they can, they can make a chart like this. Do you know what somebody that makes a chart like this would say about the chart of the little chimpanzee becoming a man? They would say, that's blasphemy. Then they draw this. Because, see, they're quoting the Bible. Og of Bashan and Goliath scale, early Canaanite giant scale. Well, this is the movie Noah. This is the picture they had of a Nephilim. Here's where it comes from, because they don't want to rightly divide the word of truth. Genesis chapter 6, this is the beginning of the chapters about the flood. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, 
that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. They just married anyone they wanted to because of looks. The key being the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? The Nephilim theorists say that the sons of God are the angels. And they do this. They get a concordance. Concordances are dangerous. Because all concordances do is show you the next occurrence of the word doesn't help you understand what the word means. They grab a concordance, and the next use of the sons of God is this. Job 1.6 Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Then they go to the next one. Well, I didn't put it in. I'm trying to save slides, because I only wanted 410. By, the, by, Monday, by Monday evening, I'll have 500. The fatal error, the fatal error of this ridiculous doctrine is presuming sons of God must mean angels. Because the next occurrence of it Many books later, in the book of Job, sons of God does mean angels. Is there not a better and more common use of sons of God? Isn't there some other use in the Bible that's just a little more readily apparent and exciting and purposeful and meaningful? Like this verse. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. The sons of God are the righteous children of Seth. The sons of God are the followers of God in the earth. And they started marrying the daughters of men, worldly women, just for looks, instead of the character and commitment to the Lord Jehovah. The ridiculous fable is due to not rightly dividing and willingness to scratch the itching ears of a doctrine-hating generation. There's no comment of the ten commentaries that I trust enough to look at from time to time. No one has ever believed the Nephilim nonsense. This, this is nonsense back here. It's just a Mickey Mouse game with the Bible by, by connecting verses that don't belong being connected together. The sons of God were the righteous on earth, the righteous men on earth who sinfully married wicked worldlings. And God drowned the world for it. Throughout the Bible, righteous people should never marry unrighteous people. God-fearing people should never marry people of the world. God hates that. He judged it severely throughout the Bible. The New Testament teaches it, that you're free to marry whom you will, only in the Lord. And So that's how we understand that. Angels never had sex with women. They resulted in mongrels that now rule the world. There's nothing like that taught in the Bible whatsoever. Did the, did the Nephilim breathe? Did they have the breath of life? If so, how'd they survive the flood? To be in Canaan. I, my, my time's out. You know, I've got another couple hundred slides. <laughs> Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus. Jesus increased in wisdom? You mean he was smarter one day than he was the day before? Mm-hmm. Yes. Is this true about Jesus? This is what he said to Nicodemus. No man hath ascended up to heaven, Nicodemus but he that came down from heaven. Who's he referring to so far? Himself. Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now wait a minute. Was Jesus with Nicodemus or was Jesus in heaven? Yes. Okay. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Does God have blood? (laughs) No. No. But, 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 it looks like it. He doesn't. Okay, another one. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, 
who created all things by Jesus Christ. I thought Jesus was the name of the baby that was born 4,000 years after creation. I thought the angel told Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And I thought the angel told Mary his name would be Jesus. And it says that Jesus Christ created all things. Is that true? How about this one? And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him. Does this say that Jesus is subject to God? It does. Jesus has two natures. This is us rightly dividing. This is why we're counted as heretics by so many. Jesus has two natures. We don't forget that. He is fully God and he is fully man. Some verses describe his human nature and some verses describe his divine nature. So that's how we interpret those verses. We go back to them and God doesn't have blood except through his incarnate son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus grew in wisdom only in his human nature, not his divine nature. If you do not rightly divide such verses about Jesus, you will end up blaspheming him in heresy. So we divide. And we separate his human nature from his divine nature. Who is this man? Martin Luther. The man who preached sola scriptura. Changed the Bible to fit with his unorthodox theology. Here's what he did. Martin Luther did not like James 3.28 the way it was, so he added the word faith. We reckon, therefore, that a man is justified by faith only. What is that called in the little solas? In the little solas? Sola fide. Faith only. Scripture only. As long as we can get rid of some scripture and change scripture. So Martin Luther did this to Romans 3.28. And this is what he wrote about the book of James. Because James says that we're justified by works. James is a right strawy epistle. No gospel character in it. I will not have it in my Bible in the number of the proper chief books. This particular meme maker. We ought to have a segment on our new website of memes. Galatians 1, 6, 9 is Paul saying, If any man or an angel from heaven or we ourselves ever preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. To Martin Luther. Justification by faith alone. This is a group of people mocking Martin Luther. Martin Luther said justification by faith alone. He had to change the Bible to do it. And he's contradicting the book of James. And it's the Catholic Church pointing out his errors. We do not look to Martin Luther for anything except one song in our hymnal, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That's Romans 3.28, but there's no alone. James 2.24, ye see then how that by works... A man is justified and not by faith only. Those two different, those two statements that appear to be contradictory don't bother us. We rightly divide it. Paul and James did not contradict each other at all. Amen. Martin Luther scorned James to keep his idea of sola fide, faith only. Paul taught legal justification by Christ, evidenced by faith. James taught practical justification by works, proving faith and they fit together perfectly a timeline of Abraham rightly has faith after justification remember that about him it wasn't until Genesis 15 that God said it was counted to him for righteousness this is the last one the Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone you got it down Pat do you know this one any single people in here that believe this and the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So it's not good to be single. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good. 
It is good for them if they abide even as I. How many wives did Paul have? None. Paul was single. And yet Paul says it is good. So we've got Paul saying it's good to be single. God saying in Genesis that it's not good to be single. We've got to rightly divide it. Has anyone ever come to me with this question before? Yes, and yes, and yes. Is it good to marry or good not to marry? <laughs> the answer is yes, because it depends on the distinction you're making. Marriage, as a general rule, is a good thing for both sexes. Notice what I said. Marriage, as a general rule, is a good thing for both men and women, guys and girls. A present distress at Corinth made it hard to be married. And that is in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 26. And those are the words. That's what quotation marks are used for. If a man or woman could forego marriage, they should at Corinth, which is where Paul wrote that. Notice, Corinthians. They could endure distress better and serve Christ better. Two reasons. Number one here, they could survive the stress. And number two, they could serve Christ better by being single. Now we know that we could serve Christ better being single, but the Lord knows that it's a lot of fun to have a spouse and that if we want to go ahead and be married, that's just fine and dandy. And so we do. The Apostle Paul didn't, Jesus didn't, John the Baptist didn't, Anna didn't, but most do. Widows that could contain were welcome to be as Anna. This is 1 Corinthians 7. Paul's explaining that when I say, I would like you to be like me, I am not setting forth a new commandment, but if you're able, due to the present distress, it'd be easier for you if you weren't married. Oh boy. <laughs> yep. When were you saved? Do you know why we have five phases of salvation? Because there's five piles on the table. Oh boy. Ever seen that before? Five piles on the table. Ever seen that before? Yeah. <laughs> if we don't rightly divide salvation, that's a few of the isms we come up with. Free willism, conditionally, just a mess. We thank God for hearing about two salvations from the primitive Baptists many years ago, but they only got us 40% of the way to the truth. Got to quit. My fingers are just twitching. <laughs> the slides will be posted. There'll be 400 to 500 slides. They are examples to go through and realize that God has saved us. Our Father in Heaven has saved us from some terrible heresies. Now, salvation's a pretty big one. How many believe like us about salvation in a percentage of so-called Christians? 1% of 1%? How about baptism? Baptism was going to come up next. How many believe like we do about baptism? Oh, I had some neat pictures, pictures too. Uh, the Lord has saved us. 95% of Christians can't even figure out that you're supposed to be buried underwater and raised up again. 1.3 billion Catholics and all the other Protestant churches that came out of her. And we just go into the Bible, take all the baptism verses on the table and put them into piles. And oh, it's so simple, so obvious, so plain. The Lord has saved us. In John 16 and verse 13, we had five divisions. That's what prompted this. This didn't come around for any other reason. There's always reasons that we can see after the fact. But in John 16, 13, we had five divisions to make. And I want you to remember that when we go into a verse, and it, and it is laborious for the man of God to explain the verse because he's drawing subtle shades of difference. Right. There's a reason why God told us to do it. And so let's keep on doing it. Right. And make sure that you demand rightly dividing of anything that comes out of this pulpit, whether it's me or anyone else. Amen. Please stand with me. I'm sorry that I didn't get further. You're welcome to get further yourself. Any children 10 and under?
that want to let me know that they know 2 Timothy 2.15, I'll be happy to see you for a difficult meeting here after I pray. Father in heaven, Lord of heaven and earth, I thank thee that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. O Lord, thou hast been very kind to us. You have shown us doctrine after doctrine how to rightly divide it and to be saved from some foolish and terrible errors. We thank thee, Lord, that we're not part of the Jehovah's Witnesses. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we're not sprinkling infants. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we don't believe in an age of accountability. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we reject the fable of Nephilim. You have blessed us in so many different ways, and we've tried to catalog a number of them so that we can offer up praise to thee and, and train and teach everyone in our church right down to single digits, if they're sharp, of how we approach the Bible. And Heavenly Father, remind these people that sometimes it'll be tedious. Sometimes others will say that we're too picky about the Word of God. But keep us picky. Yeah. Keep us tedious. Open our eyes to see what we don't see yet. Open our ears to hear what we haven't heard yet. And give us understanding because we're just little children that want to be faithful in your Word. And now we thank Thee. Go with us. Keep us by your mighty power. And let us rejoice in all the good things you have done, are doing, and will yet do for us. In Jesus' glorious name, amen. amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>